And I, I'm just so excited about 2024. It is something about a new year that just brings another level of excitement, sort of an anticipation, man. I am excited and I'm so excited because I firmly believe that God's going to do something in our lives this year that this will be, I pray three of you can receive this, a strong year. I'm receiving that. Hear me. I love this past weekend, and thank you guys for supporting my pastor. He's doing a tour. He's going from city to city teaching singles, and this past Friday, you guys came out and supported him. Yesterday morning, man, we had hundreds of people in the sanctuary, thousands online experiencing Vision Day, where I was sharing with them what I feel God is doing through Rock City Church. But while I was doing that, it made me think about you. It made me think about you because I've discovered in life you need a mission, but you also need a vision. You need a mission and you also need a vision. What's the difference, PMJ? The mission is who you are. The vision is where you're going. The mission is who you are. Please put this in your notes. Don't let another week in 2024 go by where you don't have a personal mission statement. The mission is who you are. What's the mission of Rock City Church? Love God, love people, make a difference. That's our mission. Love God, love people, make a difference. One sentence should succinctly summarize your existence. One sentence should succinctly summarize your existence. I, we love God, we love people, we aim to make a difference. That's the mission of Rock Church. Because I'm the pastor, my personal mission sometimes conflates with our corporate mission. That's who I am as a person. I just want to love God. I want to love people. And I want to make a difference. That is who I am. That is who we are. What's my foundational scripture? When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was in prison, you came and visited me. If you can't reach, if you can't read Matthew 25 and see, pause, I want to parenthetically digress. Mission is who you are. Vision is where you're going. So when I hear your mission and you get your missional scripture, I should be able to read it and see. See, because the mission to enhance the vision. Okay, what am I talking about? Has somebody ever tried to explain something to you and you didn't get it? But then the moment you understood it, you said what? I see. I, they were talking to you, but the moment you conceived and comprehended it, it caused you to see what they're saying. And what I'm pushing everybody in this room and watching from across the world is this day, from this day forward, what's your mission? Who are you this year? Who are you planning to be? Because I've discovered if the mission is my identity, if you don't know who you are, then whoever you meet will convince you what they want you to be. Which is why so many singles are confused. Because if you don't know you, anybody who walks in in your life will convince you that you are who you're not when you could have been who you could have always been. But since you don't know who you've always been, you become everybody you be around. Michael, who are you? Oh, I know who I am. I am what God says I am. I love God. I love people. I make a difference. And I speak this over your life this year, that in 2024, you won't meander through 2024 in a sort of proverbial lostness because you don't have a clue who you are at the core of who you are. No, I know who I am. And here's a message. If you don't like who I am, old school, may the Lord. Watch between me and thee, why we're absent one from another. Well, you're just doing too much. You only do too much to people who can't handle who you are. Truth of the matter is, I ain't even doing me the way I really could do me because I don't want to offend people who don't know how to do. Michael, who are you? It's critical. Who are you? And I wrestle with that. I wrestle with that. That's why if I would show you videos throughout the last years of the church, I went through a phase where I didn't feel good enough to be a pastor. So I would wear a three-piece suit and a big tie. I cut all my facial hair off because I wanted to look young. And I would have glasses on that didn't have no prescription in them. 
I tried to just stand right here and be because I thought in order for me to be successful at my assignment, I had to look like those who were successful. Or in other words, in order for me to be Joshua, I had to look, walk, and talk like Moses. When your assignment is often attached to your identity. Michael! So who are you? So that's your homework right there. That's the whole message. We're going to go home. That's the whole message. No, I'm just messing with you. Who are you? This week, I'm challenging everybody listening to me, create your mission statement. I want you to define who you are. That's what I want you to do. What's your mission? Because the mission is who you are. The vision is where you're going. Pastor Mike, who is Rock City Church? We love God. We love people. We make a difference. What's the vision? This year, we will be strong. Yeah, we will be strong. We will be strong. That's what I hear the Lord telling us, and that's so critical. I hear the Lord telling us we will be strong. But what's the problem, PMJ? Because when we tiptoe into the corridors of today's text, we find ourselves situated and acculturated in Joshua chapter 1. And in Joshua chapter 1, I see a principle that we can take and make applicable to our lives. What is that, PMJ? That just because you're saved, it does not mean you're automatically strong. Michael, just because you're saved, it does not mean you're strong. Can you put this in your notes? Just because you're saved, even if you ain't writing, just put your head down and make me think you are so I can feel good. Is that okay? Just because you're saved. Somebody just said, and they don't have a phone in their hand. It's just done. <laughs> just because you're saved does not mean you're strong. This is critical. Why, PMJ? Because I want you strong this year. When we tiptoe into the corridors of today's text, we see a very alarming message. Verse 1 is very critical. He says, after the death of Moses, the servant of God, God spoke to Joshua, Moses' assistant. He says in verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. That's critical. Moses, my servant, is dead. Then he tells him, get going. Michael, that's strong. He says, I know you're dependent on Moses. I know you love Moses. I know Moses is your leader. I know Moses is everything in you. He's your rock in life, but he gone. So here's what I need you to do. You've been crying and mourning for 30 days. I gave you 30 days to feel as sorry for yourself as you wanted to. Now, Michael, I need you to get going. I don't know who I'm preaching to early in this little message of mine, but for the last three years, you've been complaining about who ain't did what and what you ain't have. This year, it's time to get going. You may not even have the money to start the business. At least get the name of it. Get going. You may not even have the strength to get yourself out the bed, but at least just wake up and look at get going. You've been stale and stagnant too much. Well, Pastor Mike, I don't even have all the stuff I need to do what I need to do. Grandmama Theology, chapter 1, verse 2, long as I got Jesus. I don't need nobody else. You want to know why I love reading the Bible? If you ever want to have church, find you a translation, the NASB, read that. Then look at the message version. Then look at the NLT because each translation breaks it down even simpler. The message version, that's the ghetto version. The message version, that's the ghetto. If you want the hood, slang, translation, ghetto version of the Bible, go to the John 3.16, New King James. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The message version would be like, look at this. Everybody was tripping. God was like, boom, here come Jesus. And you'd be like, oh, I like that. The message version says, Moses, my servant is dead. Get going. But I like the NASB version because the NASB version says, Moses, my servant is dead. This is enough to tear the whole church up. Now, therefore, arise. Oh my God, you missed what I just said. See, because based off of what the scripture says, it tells me his posture and his position. If all God tells me to do is get going, I don't know where he was. But the NASB version says, hey, do me a favor. He dead. I need you to arise. Now, Old Testament written in Hebrew, New Testament written in Greek. So you cannot get a Greek definition of the Old Testament scripture because it was not written in Greek, it was written in Hebrew. So this Joshua is in the Old Testament, I have to look at the Hebraic definition of arise. And the Hebraic definition of arise simply means stand up. Y'all miss what I just said. 
So not only is he telling Joshua to get going, the first thing he told him was, I'm getting ready to give you a prophetic word, but I don't speak to people who like being down. I I'm preaching to three of y'all. If you don't do nothing else this week, I need you to get on up. Dude, can you just push your neighbor a little bit and shout, you've been down too long. This is your season to get up. Now, I don't know who I'm talking to. You ought to receive this. Your money about to get up. Your joy about to get up. Your creativity about to get up. Your unity about to get up. Look at your neighbor and say, how you sitting there? Get up. Yeah. And this is not me being bombastic in my teaching. No, because I like the principle that I see God take with the children of Israel and Joshua. He says, I know you're grieving. I know you're sad. I gave you 30 days. I I'm going to ask you a question that won't nobody in your circle ask you because they don't want to make you mad. Part of them scared of you because you're crazy. How long you going to cry? Y'all don't like me? Somebody roll their eyes at me. Let me go back here in case I have to run. How long are you going to cry? Y'all broke up in December of 2015. And you still mad? Baby, if you don't get up, I'm preaching. No, your mama wasn't all she could be. Yes, you may not have had the best mother, but have you ever stopped to consider maybe she did the best with what she knew to do? How you, you got children now. At least for your babies, you got to. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I discovered this is why you got to do an inventory of your circle because there's certain people who like you better down. Because when you down, it makes them comfortable that they don't want to do nothing. But if you're going to be in my life this year, am I preaching to anybody? <laughs> Get up. Oh, it's going to be real awkward for you all 2024. Because your whole squad, this is all y'all be doing right here. Just sitting there, yeah? Uh-huh, look at them. Ain't doing nothing. Uh -huh. Talking about she finna start a business. Still owe me $50. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you know, they say, now nah, they go to Rock Church or whatever. I don't even like him, to be honest. I, I, I don't even see why they doing all that. Yada, yada. What you doing? No, 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 no. What are you doing? Hey, what, what, are, you, what, what, what are you doing? What, 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 what are you? Where are we going? See, that's how you got to treat your circle. Don't even explain it to them. You ought to just say, hey, get up, get in the car. We finna go somewhere. Where are we going? Put some clothes on. Where are we going? You can put some clothes on. Trust me. They gonna be in there? Oh, they gonna be in there today. Okay, put your makeup on. I'm telling. Oh, where we going? Where we going? And then just pull up. Where we at? Welcome to Rock City. How you doing today? I thought we was going to get something to eat. We are getting something to eat. Cause the diet you on got you down. I'm giving you something that's going. Get out! So I says, he says, Moses, my servant is dead. And Moses represents more than a person. Moses represents more than a person. Part of my job as your pastor is to try to be a spiritual translator. I try to be a translator. My, one of my spiritual gifts, and I hate to call it a spiritual gift because technically it's not a spiritual gift, but I feel like it's one of the weapons that God gave me to communicate his word is clarity. I kind of got this unique ability to make complicated stuff very practical. You, you know what I'm saying? So, so I have to build, my professors at Yale Divinity would say, you have to build a bridge of contemporization from the original audience to now properly harmonizing your hermeneutic. Your hermeneutic is your biblical interpretation to revelate, re, revelate homiletics. That's how you present it. So your hermeneutic is your interpretation. Your homiletic is how you say it. All right. So, so he says Moses is dead and Moses represents more than a person. Moses represents three things. Number one, it represents dead strategies. It represents dead strategies. How Moses, when Moses died, how he do it died. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, how he did it.
kid died, Moses was standing in front of the Red Sea, right? Standing in front of the Red Sea, right? He's standing in front of the Red Sea, and then God says, what are we going to do? He said, oh, my, how are we going to do this? Pharaoh behind us. <clears throat> Mountain, <laughs> mountains to the left of me, and mountains to the right of me, and Pharaoh is behind me. I, I, y'all got to pray for me. I was raised Baptist, so my granddaddy, Bishop Calvin Woods, whenever he would say that scripture, he would stick his chest out. He would say, mountains to the left of me. Mountains to the right of me, Pharaoh behind me, and the Red Sea is in front of me, and the members are screaming, how are we going to make it through this? And then God asks Moses a question. Now, why would the progenitor of anything who knows everything ask me anything? Because whenever God asks you a question, it's not for information, it's for revelation. God is saying, I know the answer. I'm just going to ask you a question until you discover the answer for yourself. Because if I told you, you wouldn't learn. He says, what? <laughs> What's that in your hand? Moses says, it's the rod you gave me. He says, stretch it out. So the strategy that Moses used to get to the other side was he had to do it himself. He stretched out his rod. The sea parted. I heard an old preacher say, the sea took up liquid legs and he walked across on sovereign sidewalk. That sound good, didn't it? I always said I was going to say it. I, I just had to say it. So, so what happens, now we see Joshua not in front of the Red Sea. He's in front of the Jordan River. So what do we see? Moses represents dead strategies. Joshua does not have a rod. Because what worked for Moses won't necessarily work for me. Entrepreneurs, how y'all doing? Hear me. Thank God for your mentor. You need a mentor. I got a clothing line called Black Sheep, and I was so blessed. It was my first time doing it, and the first time we released it, everything sold out. I was so excited, and people kept going on the internet saying, man, that dude a genius, the way his clothing line cold. That's not me. I knew nothing about a clothing line. So I called one of my members named Tay, who does Broken Dreams. And I said, Tay, I'm your pastor in life. Will you be sort of my pastor in this? So I said, Tay, whatever you tell me to do, that's what I'm going to do. Because right now, I don't even have the information nor the right to tell you what I want to do. So I can bump my head for 12 years and figure it out. Or I can submit myself. Did you catch that? So I said, give me your strategy. See, because I didn't realize how it worked for them ain't necessarily how it's going to work for me. Throughout the Bible, I see a principle that when David shows up, Saul tells him, take my strategy. No, if you're going to fight Goliath, put on my armor, put on my strategy. David says, no, that may not work for me. What do we see? Moses used the rod. That ain't what Joshua did. Joshua had his priests. Oh, my God. Get the Ark of the Covenant. Leslie, that's crazy. Now, what is the Ark of the Covenant? Because I never want to preach in a way that you assume, to assume you know what that is. The Ark of the Covenant, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4, states that the Ark contained a golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the Ten Commandments. It represented sort of the presence of God. Moses had a staff that only he could hold, and it worked. <laughs> Joshua had a team did you catch that so when the priests stepped into the Jordan River the Jordan River did what the Red Sea did same result are y'all gonna help me preach so help me same result but what I may not do it like you but that doesn't mean the result won't be the same Dead strategies. Ark of the Covenant. Did y'all understand the Ark of the Covenant? Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God. Inside the Ark of the Covenant is manna. You remember when the children of Israel were in the wilderness and they got hungry and they looked at Moses and said, what we gonna eat? Because they didn't have a rallies. They didn't have a McDonald's. Didn't nobody pack a lunch. It was no stores. So Moses sitting there like, I don't even hunt. I don't even know how to kill nothing. And he looked at God and says, God, what I'm gonna do? Then out of nowhere, God made food. 
manna fell from the sky. They picked it up and said, what's this? There was like manna, try it. And they loved it. See, manna represents God making a way. <laughs> How to no way. See, y'all got to pray for me because I'm Baptist in my spirit. And it's certain stuff you can't play with because three of y'all can testify that there was some manna-like situations God did in your life. That when you look to your right and you look to your left for help, you didn't have nothing. And out of nowhere, God just drops. I, I, I'm trying to be dignified. So in the Ark of the Covenant was manna. Manna represents God's provision. Also, baby girl, in the Ark of the Covenant was the rod that budded. All right, what does that mean? You remember in the Bible that they, had, they were questioning the authenticity of the man of God. And they said, who called you to be a man of God? And God says, I tell you what, everybody put your rod on the ground. They, every preacher took their rod out, put it on the ground. And God said, I'm going to make the one bud. I'm going to make plants. I'm going to make sort of flowers grow out of something that's not connected to the soil. <laughs> because if I disconnect a branch from the tree... After a certain while, nothing will grow from it. And out of nowhere, Aaron's rod begins to bud, which means God, when he picks you, you don't need what they have. All you need is God's hand. I, 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 I got to go. I'm preaching today. And then it was the Ten Commandments. So he says the strategy had to change. Strategy had to change. That's important. So not only do I have to understand that when Moses died, it represents dead strategies. Number two, it also represents dead seasons. Dead seasons. Moses represents dead seasons. Why? Can you put this in your notes if you don't mind? Why do I need to probably pray about a new strategy? This is critical. Because Moses represents an expired strategy that worked to get the people out of Egypt, but the strategy didn't work to get Egypt out of people. Do I need to say that again? Moses' strategy was good for getting the people out of Egypt, but it wasn't good for getting the Egypt out of people. <laughs> Michael, that's why sometimes you can take a person out of place, but you can't take the place out of person. So what am I saying? Yes, God brought you out. I want to say that better. I'm sorry, I want to say that better. Yes, God brought you out of it, but it's your job to bring it. Dead strategies. Then number two, we see dead seasons. Moses represented a season that no longer exists. One of the greatest weapons that the enemy uses to stunt our growth, can you put this in your notes, is unprocessed grief. I, want, I, I really want to do a better job as a pastor. I try my best to be the best that I can be. One of the things I really want to do better in 2024 and beyond is that I feel like, especially in the African-American context, where we celebrate the celebration of the church service better than we do the systematic structure of ministry. See, in black church, we're going to have great church. We don't necessarily have programs that help you become the best you. We master celebration, not transformation. Oh no So what am I trying to do right now I'm trying to get you to realize That yes God gonna keep you But God shouldn't have to chase you Y'all don't like me And one of the greatest weapons that the enemy uses To stunt our growth Is unprocessed grief and too much of church, be it African-American church, uh, a white church, Latino church, spirituality at large, self-help, too much of what we're doing in this season is teaching us about how to celebrate when we get it, but not how to survive when we lose it. <laughs> and you cannot properly celebrate resurrection without embracing the fact that without crucifixion, you can never have a resurrection. Put scripture on it. The Lord giveth. And the Lord does what? Take it away. So what did I discuss? One of the weapons that the enemy uses to stunt our growth is unprocessed grief. Unprocessed grief. Instead of dealing with the grief in our life, I believe many of us practice replacement theology. 
replacement theology. It was certain stuff that happened to me as a child that I didn't realize was programming me until I became an adult. I never forget, we went over to my cousin's house, we playing football, we get in the car, and I wake up the next morning, you know you get in the car, you go to sleep. I wake up the next morning, I can't find my football, left it over my cousin's house, I act a fool, mom, my football, my football, and to shut me up, she took me to Family Dollar, got me another football. Fast forward, my son, I, I never got lost my blanket, left that over grandma's house, all the cousins used to go to grandma's house to spend the night, she said, don't worry about it, she just threw me another blanket, you can have this one. Yep, my sister would lose her Barbie doll. It would break. She would just say, I got you, baby. Just take this one. And I discovered when I lost my football, they just gave me another one. When I lost my blanket, they just gave me another one. When I lost this, they just gave me another one. Now you grown, and every time you lose a person. <laughs> so now you are an adult who's dating, and you are programmed to think the quickest way to get over one <laughs> it's to get under another one because we were never taught how to process our grief I want to free you real quickly I'm in certain seasons of your life you need to stop telling God to fix it and you might need to ask God to fix me because if God fixes me I can in turn fix it you ain't gonna say amen only three people gonna feel this but in 2024, there may be something that jumps off in your life. And in times past, you will shout, Lord, get me out of it. What I'm telling you is in order to be all God calls you to be, it's certain stuff God shouldn't take you out. You should actually sit in it and feel it. Look at that. Nobody clap right there. I just told you, if I would have said you was going to get a house, you would have slapped your neighbor in the eye, in the eye her lash would have came off. But now you don't want to say nothing to me. It's certain stuff you need to feel. Because I want to submit to you some stuff you didn't learn because God rescued you so soon And because if God God will never take you out of a storm that he can develop you in Certain stuff you got to feel Yeah, that's see that's where I'm at now at 40. I'm 40 now. I'm, I'm grown I'm 40 now. It's certain stuff I like feeling. I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to feel this. No, I can tell you right now, never forget the day I went to Cheesecake Factory and we sitting in there eating, having a good time, in there just actually shooting our thing, me and D talking about all the stuff God going to do through Rock City Church years ago. And one day we're going to have this and we're going to have a big old choir. Then the praise team going to be in front of the choir and people going to be at our church. It's going to be the best thing in the world nobody ever seen. Then the lady be like, who going to pay for the meal? I said, I got D, don't worry about it. Boom. Then all of a sudden she did that walk back to me. She's like, hey, excuse me, uh, this, one, this one didn't work. I was like, no, you're tripping. No, you just run it again. You're good, trust me. Then while she walked away, you know what you do. Just come. Mm. <laughs> then out of nowhere, this is the devil right here. Stuck. It's like a draft hit my account. I ain't see coming. So now I'm sitting in cheesecake like, oh, my God. So then I look at D like, man, you're going to have to get this one. D said, it's cool. Then all of a sudden she walked back. Excuse me, you too, sir. It's not. I'm like, oh, my God. This is... <laughs> Oh my God, this is going to be bad. And then me and D, this is a true story, and I should have put the receipt on the screen. Me and D, this is probably 12 years, we sitting in cheesecake laughing, like weak in the late, like what's funny? We had to call to the church, I'm like, hey, is anybody over at the church or anybody? Mama, daddy, somebody, run your car. We had cheesecake. I'm going to be washing dishes. I don't know what I'm going to do. But we sitting there, and to this day, I still got the picture of the receipt because I wasn't bitter because I was broke. I was sitting there like, I want to feel this. Because I want to make you a promise. It will never. Jesus. Y'all miss what I just said. Y'all miss what I just said. I live in an extended state off exit 133 Kilgore Memorial. It's called Rhyme Garden Inn. And we would be in that Rhyme Garden Inn and I wasn't embarrassed. I used to be in there like, yeah, I want to feel this right here. I could easily call my mom and them to come rescue me out of this. But if they rescue me out of it, that's a shortcut. I won't learn the lesson that I need to learn. It's certain stuff God don't need to take you out. You need to just sit there and be like, okay, I feel this. Yeah, if you go through a breakup this year, you better not pick up that phone and call Keisha, Tommy, or Ray Ray. I just want you to sit there and be like, hey, I just want to tell you thank you for breaking my heart. The truth of the matter is, you weren't even on my level when I met you. I was trying something different, so I'm going to feel this so I can make a better decision next year. Yep. Even if the power get cut out, even if the power get cut out, and you on the phone, girl, what you gonna, bro, what you gonna do? No, I'm good, I'm gonna spend the night here tonight. I, I wanna feel this. 
because there's some better choices and better decisions I'm gonna make in 2024. See, only seven of y'all shout, because all of y'all are shout when the Lord give it. But you gotta be mature to shout when the Lord take it. Process it. It's certain stuff you gotta feel. It's certain stuff you got to feel. Then you got to deal with it. My oldest son was in a wreck a couple weeks ago. I told y'all that, right? He wrecked his car. So one of the things I'm processing now and probably going to try to talk to a counselor about in the next week and a half, two weeks, is that every time he leaves the house now, it's sort of this anxiety. Like if he's gone and I know he's driving, it's like every time my phone rings, I kind of jump just a little. And I'm like, hey, you good? Where you at? Call me when you get there. Call me. Hey. You ain't, and I found myself screaming. Hey, you didn't call me when you got there. And so I realized, devil, you a lie. Mm -mm. I need to process that. Oh, my God. That's why in 2024, you're going to see me pushing more because we got to be prepared when life happens. I can't promise you a million dollars. I can't promise you you're going to be successful at the level you want to be. I can't promise you're going to be all that God called. I can't promise you're going to go to the league. I can't promise your wife going to always love you, your husband going to always be faithful. But it is one thing according to the Bible I can't promise you, that trouble will be with you. God says it's one thing everybody can count on. You're going to face some trouble. So can I ask you a question? If you know you're going to face some trouble, why not already be prepared? I never forget my brother, best football player in the state of Alabama, 2003, 2004, goes to Florida State, has a great career, balling his senior year, doing all he's supposed to do, tears his knee up. So in essence, it was so close to the draft that he couldn't even really have a good combine, none of that. Jacksonville calling, I think Miami calling, all these teams calling, but he can't do nothing. And all my athletes know once another draft cycle go by, it kind of pass you by. So I had to watch him for a year process that for 19, 22 years, years he's had one goal go to the league so now I watched him have to process that grief watch this because grief just ain't losing a person some of us gonna have to deal with the grief that we might not be what we thought we were gonna be he said but I thought I was gonna be so and so I thought I was gonna be this I thought about now I would be that I know I know I know I know but my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts I know he was talking to Jeremiah but I see a text that I can take and make applicable to my life thank you God for I know the plans Michael that I have for you your plan may to be this but my plan is for you to be that and I'm gonna ask you a question if you want to be this that's cool but I'm not over there on this I'm over here on that and the safest place in the whole wide world it's where God is. So some of y'all need to deal with the reality that you may never be this. But if you trust what God wants you to be over here, what God wants me to be is way greater than what... Dead seasons, I gotta go. Number three, dead squads. Dead squads. That's vernacular for dead teams. I just wanted, I just wanted my essence to match. That syntax, dead strategies, dead seasons, dead squads. That, that can mean dead teams. There may be people on your team, entrepreneurs, visionaries, people, family, anybody that your team need to switch. Why is that important, PMJ? I need you to catch this because not only did Moses die in the wilderness, his whole generation did too. If you ain't careful, if you're not careful, what if Moses and his entire team dying in the same place reveals that I'll never arrive in the right place while holding on to the wrong people? Do I need to say that again? What if it reveals that I'll never arrive in the right place while holding on to the wrong people? The only difference with the children of Israel changing their location was the decision that God made to change the leadership. The most important person you will ever lead in your life is you. Have you been leading yourself in the wrong direction? The question I want to ask you in 2024 is have you been leading you in the wrong direction? If the Holy Spirit is the GPS, and you are what you want, your desires. It's the GPS saying turn left, but you on your life saying, no, I'm going to go right. 
Some of us need to stop blaming people. You made that choice. We don't talk about that in church. You want to know what I can't stand? We demonize. I want to say that better. I want to say that better. I want to say that better. We demonize. Oh, Michael. 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 We demonize. Yeah. 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 We, we tend to demonize. No. No, 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 no. Yeah. We, we, we demonize or deify. That's what we do. We either demonize or deify. Make that make sense. We either make, when stuff go wrong, we, it's automatically the devil. But when it go right, you the truth. So when you get the job, told you don't play with me, I'm him. I'm him. Told you don't play with me. I knew this was my I knew this was my year. I felt when I walked in, you should have saw me on that interview. But when you get fired, the devil busy. No, you was late. You was messy. You never did your job right. You walk around there talking about supervisors to messy team members who know you better than them. So then they would go dry snitch. They had to, that ain't the devil, it's you. The devil didn't keep him out the promised land. Moses did. <laughs> no, that's it. I'm not going to make you feel better about it. That's it. Y'all was waiting on a... No, that's it. The devil didn't keep him out the promised land. Moses did. Watch this. The devil... Had... Okay, okay, okay. All right, do me a favor. I want you to put this in your notes. Spell promise. P R O. M-I-S-E. Now spell land. That's why y'all don't realize what's happening. Because for years we never had context. God didn't give him the promised land. He gave them the promised. I need you to put a D on the end of promise. I promise and he promised are two different contexts. I promise is present tense. I promised is past tense. So God is saying what I got for you has already been stated. It's already prepared. The devil can't do nothing without that because it's already in motion. The devil didn't stop Moses. Moses stopped Moses. God told Moses to speak to the rock. Moses used a dead strategy. He struck the rock. And God said because you continue to do your own thing, not only will you not get it, but everything connected to you won't get it. That's why you got to cut certain people off. I'm not sacrificing my promise because you keep doing dumps. I'm not preaching to anybody. I can't take shortcuts. So Pastor Mike, define a shortcut. Can I borrow 12 minutes to give them back to you next week? Okay, let's go. Let's define a shortcut. Put this in your notes. A shortcut, Michael, is a downgrade to our quality of life and a delay in our quality in life. No shortcuts. A shortcut is a downgrade to our quality of life and a delay to our quality in life. Can't take a shortcut. I can't take a shortcut. I can't take a shortcut. What are you talking about, PMJ? I want you to remember this scripture. Put it in your notes. Proverbs 21 and 5. Here it is. Good planning, NLT version. Proverbs 21 and 5. Good planning and hard work lead to prosperity. Y'all don't even know when to shout. I wanna, I'm going to get me an old church. I'm telling y'all. The same way these kids get in the transfer portal, let a strong Baptist church recruit me. Because y'all be making me work. I have to preach it. Leather is hot. I'm up in this leather. It's hot. I have to preach. I have to walk all the way over here. Then if I was at a strong Baptist church, I could have just stood right here. Didn't even sweat. Just, hey, hey, good planning and hard work lead to prosperity. That's all I would have had to do. And they'd have been like, yes, Lord. Y'all be sitting there like, and... So I'm making it very clear. Any church is watching, I'm in the portal. I'm in the portal. No, I'm just saying seriously, but I should say, but spiritually, folk. Look at what it says. Good planning. Put this in your notes. This is scripture. And hard work lead to prosperity. Let's pause and parenthetically digress. Prosperity ain't always money. See, so, so, so that's the problem, especially with this prosperity gospel, to where everything is, if you scream loud enough, it'll be here in the morning. 
I want to tell you, if you shout right now, by the time you get home, I believe God can do that. But miracles shouldn't be a necessity daily. Every year, you shouldn't be believing God for a miracle. Why? I'm going to say this. This hit me. Paying your bills every month shouldn't be a miracle. I've been there. I've been there. 29th, God, I need you to do it. 30th, hi, God, I need you to do it. 31st, God, I need you to do it. First, all right now. Second, I'm just putting it in your hands. 12th, it is what it is at this point. 14th, look at God. That shouldn't be the norm. But look at this, put the scripture on the screen. Don't run from that scripture, put it on the screen. Good planning and hard work lead to prosperity. My babies love me. I, I, I love being a daddy, I mean this. I will stop pastoring and preaching if it meant costing me being a daddy. That's the truth. I will stand right there and say, hey, I love y'all so much, but my schedule and everything I'm doing right now, my boys and my kids, it, it just ain't working. So God bless y'all, I love you. God bless you. Maybe I just preach online from my room, but my kids need me. See, because the only people who gonna remember I work late nights is my kids. No, I love being a daddy. I, I just prayed with Mace, and he getting ready to go to 707 now. So that's why I was kind of late coming out. So I just tried to lay hands on his shoulder and lay hands on his knees and lay hands on his feet, like have a good day today. I love being a daddy. So look at me. I have, a, I have prosperity and love and honor for my babies. See, a good example for your life would be put bank on one side of your notes and then put bill on the other side and then take money out of it. When it comes to my love bank from my kids, I'm in overflow. When it comes to my peace, I got a good amount of peace. But if the right problem come, it'll overdraft my peak. Did you see that? Oh, I got joy. I got joy. But if the right person walk out my life, it'll overdraft my joy. If I find out she ain't what I thought she was, that'll over, overdraft my joy. If I find out he got something going on across town, that'll overdraft my peace. So when God says I'm giving you prosperity, Stop always being so thirsty for currency. Mm. If currency could fix anything, Steve Jobs would still be alive. If currency would fix anything, billionaires would die from cancer. If currency could fix anything, you hear me? So sometimes I need prosperity and peace. Mm. Oh, this one mess six of y'all up. I want prosperity and creativity. God, you ain't got to give me $100,000. Give me a million dollar idea. I'll put the work in. <laughs> Proverbs 24 and 21 and 5. Proverbs 21 and 5. Good planning and hard work lead to prosperity. <clears throat> but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. I'm going to have church by myself and only seven folk in the balcony and three of y'all on the floor and ten of y'all online going to catch this. This is going to be the year right here I get the plan. Oh, y'all missed what I just said. Put that scripture back on the screen. If you want the prosperity, what did he say? Good planning and hard work. See, some of y'all hardly working. Then some of us work hard. But the problem is for the last ten years, yes, we've been working hard, but we never really had the plan. So when overflow came, you would have it, but then you would just start moving. Then you would look up and all of a sudden the money was gone. 2024 gonna be the year, Michael, that I get the plan. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but you ought to just shout, I'm getting the plan this year. Matter of fact, God, don't even send it to me till I get the plan that I'm not wasting another blessing. I'm not wasting another moment. I'm not wasting another idea. This year, I need the plan. I gotta go. What's the plan? Yep, that's what I want to know. If you're in a relationship right now, that's the question you should be asking. Bro, you ought to go home tonight. And when she get home, you ought to have rose petals at the front door. Rose petals at the front door. Like, oh, lights down low, music playing. Put on your red dress. Some of that sweet perfume. Mm -hmm. Good. I was saved. I don't know all the lyrics. 
look good on you. And she's going to walk in there, oh, what we got going today? And I don't want you to say nothing. Now, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, come on, don't, come on. Come on, come on. Sit, sit right there, sit right there. And I want you to just rock real slow. And be like, hey, what's the plan? <laughs> She can be like, no, 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 don't, don't touch me. What's the plan? Because if we don't come up with a plan, just like last year, you're going to be blaming me for stuff when the truth of the matter is you be really doing the dumb stuff, then expect me to fix your dumb decisions. What's the plan? Ooh, I feel God on that right there. No, you got to be able to sit down and say, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to make some cuts this year. We're going to make some hard decisions. That vacation we said we was going to take, we're not taking that. We're going to make some sacrifices. Because if we do, if we do what won't nobody do today, we'll be able to live like can't nobody else live tomorrow. What's the plan? I feel God on me. Yeah. I, walk, I used to walk in this building. I used to drive by this building for five years. I would call the realtor and I would say, Jake, can you open the door for me? He was like, yeah, Pastor Mike, the side door open for you. And I would sit in the lobby and write my sermons and walk through here. I would be in here in the dark, fake preaching. They probably got to be, I would be in here like, God, God told me I'm going to tell you. And my team would be laughing at me. For five years, I would do that. Five years, didn't have a dime. I'm sitting in meetings talking about buying a building. Don't have a dime for it. And I'm in there talking big. Yeah, we're going to come in here. We're going to do, yeah, we probably going to put screens right there. We're going to do so-and-so-so right there. Then messed around and got it. Didn't have a dime to fix it. So now I'm sitting in there like, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? All right, all right. I don't want to stand before everybody and beg every Sunday because they don't come to church to hear me beg. They come to get picked up. So here's what I'm going to do. Hey, God bless you, Rock City Church. We're going to close the church for a couple months, and I'm going to save some money, and then I'm going to just do stuff bit by bit. I didn't know it was going to take six months. In my head, I said, like, maybe we can do it in two months, and I'll figure it out. Do we know what I did? I said, I got to figure it out. So all I did was, look, you know what? I tell you what, mm, they want me to come sing big. Take the price up. Yeah. Pastor Mike, you'll come see me big. Sure will. How much? <laughs> I'm a New York. I got it. I got it. Detroit. I got it. I got it. Philadelphia. I got it. I got it. And it's going to boom. Then I will come back to the church. How much we need for the floor? Pastor, we just got the floor done. What are we doing now? We're doing it downstairs. Dang. Okay. DC. I got it. I got it. I got it, I got it. I will take a picture of the check and bring my boys in the room. Hey, no dad went here yesterday. I want to show you something. I went and sung in this city right here. They gave me this amount of money. I had to pay the people who sang with me. Said, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this money. So when y'all go over to the children's wing and y'all see so-and-so, so-and-so, I, I was trying to, then I would go on, was online and tell y'all, y'all, we got light. We got light. Then you'll be like, okay, we got some lights. You don't even realize you hadn't been in church in six months but the reason you could tolerate it is because everybody knew the plan that's why when i came to church today and i saw y'all pulling up looking good and you're holding your loved one hand and children in the children's church and folks sitting in the balcony i get excited not because god did it because some of this ain't favor some of this is the result of being patient to the plan and i want to speak by faith that the difference between the 2023 you and the 2024 you, you still got the favor. But this year you're going to have, I don't know who I'm preaching to. You ought to just jump up, sit down and shout, I got a plan. I got to go. I got a plan. I'm going to get my money right. I'm going to be creative. I'm going to do so-and-so, so-and-so. Next six months, I'm not dating nobody. That ain't a part of the plan. Then Denzel going to walk up. Then Keisha going to be like, that's you right there. That's God. That's God. And you're going to be like, mm, oh me. <laughs> but I got a plan. And dating you going to take, y'all laughing at me. But it's the truth. Because the moment you put your plan on paper, the devil going to walk in the room and be like, all right, let me see if they really committed as they say they are. And I came to discuss that if you commit to the plan, good planning leads to prosperity, hard work, but shortcuts. And a shortcut is not a setup. A shortcut is a setback that creates lack. Whenever you take a shortcut, it leads to immediate satisfaction, but it cripples your futuristic appreciation. That's why those of you who got it quick don't take care of it. And those of y'all who had to fight for everything, 
take good care of it. Because you ain't have to work for it. Okay, okay, okay. I'm a, I'm, I got to go. I'm going to put my business in the streets. Don't judge me. Uh, I'm going to just be, can I, can I be honest? Can, is this a safe place? Uh, is this a safe place? Okay. All right, 2018, I'm like 295 pounds, right? Y'all remember the, the pre-big, Pastor Mike. Y'all remember that? I, I was big, no beard, really just facial hair, just walking around looking like somebody's granddaddy. Boom, I'm, I'm, I'm 290 pounds, all right? All right, so then all of a sudden, I kind of took this trip, right? I kind of took this trip, saw a friend in Mexico. He was like, boom, 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 yeah, yeah. All right, so then all of a sudden, all right, my appetite changed. I started dropping 290, boom, 275, boom, 275, 245, boom, 245, 230, boom, 230, 220, boom. So then by the time big drop, I'm like 215, looking good, boom, slim. I'm, I'm super slim, head didn't shrink, though, so my head was kind of just bobbling like this. But my body was little, but my head was still the 290-pound size, so it, it didn't quite line up, but it was good, boom. All right, so I got my, I'm, I'm all slim, I'm feeling good. My doctor say to me, yeah, man, this should jumpstart your healthy living. I'm like, cool, yeah, I ain't care, I'm slim. I'm wearing skinny suits now, skinny jackets. I'm in express, slim jeans. I was so excited, you know, because I'm a big boy, but I was slim. I'm in that joint. Hey, God bless y'all, y'all doing all right. Bless you, bless you. Come on, come on, give God praise, boom. All right, so 2019, I'm like 210. <clears throat> 2020, I'm like 225. <laughs> 2021, I'm like 236. <laughs> 2022, I'm like 241. All right, like, like right now, I'm like two, my business. All right, and so this morning, I'm getting frustrated because I'm like, man, it's like, man, I wish I can get back to my 2019. Then I, I got convicted because I didn't work to lose weight. I took a shortcut. And because I took a shortcut, I got a result. But I didn't learn the habits I should have learned to sustain what I had. And many of y'all keep trying to want to go around struggle. But God won't release the promise when you skip the process. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? God won't release the promise if you skip the process. Did you know that the average person who wins the lottery is broke within a year? $30 million and broke in two years because they got it. But they skipped the step. And I need you to understand what God's doing in your life this year. No shortcuts. When you go through this year, I want right before you panic, I want you to say, because <laughs> it's lessons you learn in the wilderness <clears throat> that help you become what God called you to be in the promised land. I got to go, y'all. Y'all tired of me? Moses is dead. Verse 1 is enough to tell the whole church up. He says, hear me when I to throw it on the screen. Verse 1, he says, after the death of Moses, servant of God. Leave that up there. Spoke to Joshua, Moses' assistant. Pause. Y'all missed it. I, there is no wasted ink in the Bible. Look at it now. After the death of Moses, the servant of God, comma, God spoke to Joshua, comma, Moses' assistant. Y'all missed it. I'm going to say it again. After the death of Moses, the servant of God, comma, God spoke to Joshua, comma, Moses' assistant. God tells us what Moses means to him before he tells us what Moses meant to Joshua. Because he wants it to make a very clear point that Moses meant more to me than he meant to you. And I'm trying to be patient with you about crying. But if I'm at the point where I'm moving on, you should be moving on too. You his assistant, but he was my servant. He said, I want to make it very clear. After the death of Moses, the servant of God, God spoke to Joshua, Moses' assistant. What did he say to him? Moses, Michael, my servant is dead. What does he tell him? Get going, Michael. Cross this Jordan River. You mm, and all the people cross the country. Michael, I'm giving to the people of Israel. Verse 3 is enough to tell the whole church up, which is why you can't take shortcuts. He says, I'm giving you. Every square inch of the land that you set your foot on, just Michael, as I promised Moses, you didn't shout because you missed it. He says, wherever you walk and wherever your feet touch, it's yours. Six of y'all should have just walked right where you at and shout, I'm walking in the natural and I'm walking in the spiritual. 
Because God's giving me everything. Look at this. He says, I'm giving you every square inch of land that you set, Michael, your foot on. You missed it. Every square inch of land that you set, Michael, your foot on. You didn't shout because you missed verse 2. If they go back to verse 2, throw verse 2 on the screen. He says, my servant is dead. I'm finna run. He says, cross this Jordan. He's talking to Joshua, right? But he says, comma. You, you caught that. And all your people. Now, I need you to catch this. Now, who's going to cross the Jordan? Everybody. Who is God talking to? Joshua. Did everybody hear the word? No. Who heard the word? But because Joshua heard the word, he then now has a word for everybody. All right, so how do everybody know what they're going to get? He says, Joshua, I need all y'all to cross over. Verse 3, and every square inch that your foot touched, not y'all foot. This is why people can't handle you. Because when they walk in places, they just walk in. But when you walk in, you take dominion. I'm preaching to somebody. Your family would treat you better if they realize your feet go determine they seat. I, I don't know who I'm preaching to, but you ought to just shout, you preaching to me, PMJ. That's why I gotta be successful. My mama and them gonna be blessed because of me. My nieces and nephews gonna be blessed because of me. You ought to shout, I'm the one. Give me Michael, I'm giving you. Michael, I'm giving you, Michael, I'm giving you every square inch. I was tripping the other day, tripping the other day. My, my Dove Award came in the mail. I'm looking at it, oh man, it's so cool. Then it messed me up. It messed me up because it came with a letter. They said, man, we would like to thank and celebrate Michael McClure, Rodney Turner, James Fortune, so-and-so, 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 so-and-so. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh my God, I didn't realize, Michael, when you win song of the year, just because I was singing, Michael, everybody who was attached to it. That's why you gotta get haters out your life. Cause real people be like, when you win, I, I just need you to reach over that hater you sitting next to and hop out the other neighbor and shout, I pray God give it to you. Because when God give it to you, everything connected to you going to be blessed. I know we got to get out of here, but you ought to shout that everything God promised you is all ready. I got you. I got to get out of here. He says, it's right there in verse 3. He says, I'm giving you every square inch of land. You set your foot on, Michael, just Michael, as I promised Moses, from the wilderness to this Lebanon River. I need you to catch this. Then look at what he says right here. I'm finna run, verse 5, all your life. I'm sorry, I skipped a part. East of the Great River to the Euphrates River, the Hittite country and the west of the Great Sea. Then he makes a statement that just makes me get excited. Y'all you, 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 better stop getting ahead of me. Let me set it up. I'm preaching. You ain't preaching. There we go. Ooh. Then he makes a statement I get excited about. He says, you heard what I just said? It's all yours. See, you didn't shout because you think you're going to get it incrementally this year. I'm releasing an anointing over your life that you're going to get it all at the same. I wish I had a thousand folk in the chat and in the back who would just high five five people and shout, it's all yours. That's the wrong somebody, touch somebody, tell them it's all yours. And I don't have to wait till the battle is over. I can shout right now. I dare you to just touch three people and say, I'm gonna shout for your breakthrough. You shout for my breakthrough. I'm gonna shout for your miracle. You shout for my miracle. Yes. Yes. Is there anybody in here that can slap your neighbor a high five and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, God is giving you everything that he promised your family. But you got to get up 
out of depression get up out of anxiety take your neighbor by both of their hands and pull them on their feet and shake your neighbor you still ain't shook them right I said shake your neighbor no 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 you still ain't shook them right I said shake your neighbor y'all still ain't shook them right I said shake them and rock them rock them and shake them shake them and rock them rock them and shake them shake 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 your neighbor and say neighbor it's already mine neighbor it's already mine cause God is taking me higher I dare somebody to just weep like God is taking you higher just leap like God just took you oh, no, 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 to another level now look at your neighbor and say neighbor I got a prophesy to you say neighbor I got a word for you I know it gets rough I know it gets tight, but I got a word, a word for you. I, 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 I know it's all right. I need you to find another neighbor and say, neighbor, can I prophesy to you? Billers may roll, breakers may dash, but I know he's a... I got it. It's already mine. It's already mine. I said it's already mine. I said it's already mine. You may not have the money, but it's already yours. You may not have the connection, but it's already yours. You may not know nobody, but it's already yours. Cause God, I, 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 I know that God will make a way out of no way. I've had some good days. And I've had some bad days And I've even had some hills to climb But when I look back over my life I'm giving you 60 seconds You ought to praise God For every mountain that he brought you over Everything, everything I promised Moses, I'm going to give you. Every, my granddaddy, my granddaddy who walked with Dr. King, who sat with Abernathy and Shuttlesworth, he called me he, in tears. He just kept calling. He said, boy, you doing stuff. <laughs> that we was beat for, that we cried for. He said, Mike, everything God told me he was going to do messed me up. He said, I ain't know he was going to do it through you. <laughs> and there's some stuff 
It's some stuff. God promised your family that bad decisions aborted. It's some stuff that God promised your bloodline that no plan defaulted on. Ooh. That's why when you talk to your parents every now and then, I just need to ask you, I need you to ask them, what did you want to do when you was growing up? Mama, what was your dream? If your grandparents still alive every now and then, just go sit with them and say, where you thought, the way you ever wanted the family to be? No, it's some land God got in your family's bloodline that's coming to you. There's opportunities that God's sending to you. He says, everything I promised Moses, Jesus. He says, I'm going to get to you. You want to know why I work as hard as I do? And my boys ain't in the service, so I can say it. When I look at them, I just want my end to be a great start for them. Some of us know what it's like to have to scratch out of every hole. And he says, I got to get y'all out of here. He says, it's all yours. He says, it's all yours. When we got this property, we just had the church, the church in the field. And we were happy. I was like, God, thank you. Then we messed around and looked at the survey. And we saw that part of the church's survey was on the dorms next door. Then we picked up that phone. We was like, you know, we finished. I'd never forget. I called the staff and I said, I feel faith on me. I said, get on the phone. Let's figure that out. And to this day now, when I see it, when I was talking to them, they said, y'all got the original vision. I said, what's that? The original vision was the church, the school, the dorms. Then it's a house we own right next to the dorm. And I'd be sitting right there now. I say, God, you said it was all yours. <laughs> look what he says. Look at this next verse. He says, no one will be able to hold out against you. No one, stay on point in the back. No one will be able, Leslie, to hold out against you. That's important. Why, Pastor Mike? That's, that's important because some of you, there are things you're believing God for. And some people are shrewd businessmen and women. And they jack up prices. And some of y'all looking at a house right now, you're like, that'd be the perfect house. But people trying to capitalize off interest rates and so-and-so, so-and-so. God told me to tell you, no one will be able to hold out against you. And hear me. And he, and he, and he says, just flow with me. He says, in the same way I was with Moses, I'll be with you. Now, you thought you needed Moses. You never realized Moses was only Moses because he had me. Watch this. So you may not have Moses, but as long as you got me. Watch this. Yeah. So the same way I was with Moses, I'll be with you. And here's a word. I never thought I was good enough. Never. Never. I'm just starting to get the confidence that of who God got me. I never thought I was good enough. Always kind of just never really believed in me. I said that in one of my songs, The Black Sheep Freestyle. I said, I never really believed in me. I believed in my dad's belief in me. My dad would look at me and be like, you different. Mike, trust me, you're going to change. He would, he would literally check me out of school. It would be so crazy because I was a bad kid. I would be going to do something stupid. They'd come over there and come. Michael McClure to the office. I'd come to the office. My dad just put me in the car. He'd be like, hey, you different. You know that? I'd be like, yes, sir. He'd be like, no, you don't get it. He's just driving me. That's why the Boutwell was in my spirit. He would just take me in the Boutwell, and we would stand there. He'd be like, yeah, you're going to fill this up one day. And I'd be like, dad, I'm ready. I'm ready. Like, trust no, just see him breathing in, breathing in. I would be 12 years old. He would have me sitting in board meetings, count marriage counseling, people in there fussing. They'd be fussing. And he would just stop in the middle of them fussing. See, Mike, this is when you gotta, just got to stay calm. And I'm like, if you don't pay attention, like, this is going to get crazy in here. Oh, that man, my life. There are certain times in my life where I have to pray because I don't know if I'm working to please God sometimes or just to please him. Because the two sometimes become a necklace because if you've got a good father, you sometimes hear the voice of God through them. And, and I'm like, he was cold, cold, cold. That's why when you see Rock City and y'all be like, man, Rock City dope. I'm only doing what I saw him do. And I told him, he's looked at me. I never get it. He said, Mike, 
Perry Stone, many of you don't know who Perry Stone is. He was an evangelist and a prophet in the late 90s, 2000. They would do crusades. And Perry Stone and all these people would come. And he looked at my daddy, he, this true story. He said, the next major move of God for Birmingham, Alabama is going to come through your church. And my dad, everybody's crying. And about a year ago, my dad said, Mike, I always thought he meant me. He never said it was me. He said it was going to come through. So, so, so when you see a rock city, that's the promise that he gave a revelation. So, so I want you to catch this. So when God do it for you this year, shame on you if you get it and abandon the people that he promised it to. Some of the blessings, Michael, some of the doors that God opened for you ain't because of you. No, I'm getting there. Your mama going to be good once God got you. Your family going to be good once God bless you. He says, the same way I was with Moses, I'll be with you. And here's the part that messed me up because I never felt good enough. I had a child out of wedlock. That's the death penalty in church. Never hid it, never run from it. I had to stand before the whole church in my early 20s and tell them I did it. Didn't understand that part, but that's how church was then. I wasn't finna not be a daddy to please nasty church people. So, hey guys, I, I'm young. I had a child. I'm sorry. Yada, yada, yada. So, so much stuff happened to me young. I just never felt worthy based off of church folk. You get what I'm saying? Church folk will have you thinking you got to be Jesus. And, and, and so the part that messes me up is this. Is it's on the screen. I won't give up on you. I won't leave you. I won't give up. That I would say this to myself every night. He's not going to give up on me. He won't leave me. I won't give up on you. I won't leave you. I never get we had to get Miles conditioned for sleeping in his own room. We would have to take turns sometimes just sleeping in the room till he fell asleep. Because he couldn't sleep if he thought he was in there by himself. So we had to convince him, we're not leaving you. Now you know what he say, get out. Because there are seasons when you need his manifested presence with you. Then there are seasons when you know he got you. He says, I won't give up on you. I won't leave you. And here's our vision for the year. Strength. So when I say this year the vision is to be strong, I'm not saying I want you to be able to take a lot. That's unnatural. We got to stop this beat up theology that we be preaching that the more hell you go through, the more saved you are. You know, you know, like they got us thinking that church people need to be broken, dusty, and broke. Like, don't put on no Vaseline. You got to be holy. Like, no. No, you're going to be saved and paid. No, you're going to be blessed and intellectual. You're going to be an entrepreneur and an intercessor. You got an ambidextrous anointing. You need to shout. I got I'm all that. Somebody say strong. What I'm saying is, don't you ever do nothing in this life and forget that God won't give up on you. Because life's going to happen. Life's going to happen. I need you to tap into a belief that, nah, God got me. I'm going to be strong in the Lord. God, I pray. Mm. God, we, we're fasting right now, God. We're, we're sacrificing something to get closer to you. Some of us is food. Some of us is no meat. Some of us is social media. God, my boys aren't playing the game for 21 days. Mason's not doing his cell phone for the next seven days. Certain people are doing absolute. Certain people are just not doing certain things. Whatever it is, God, that's between them and you. Just give us the strength to be committed to it. God, I ask right now that you deposit in us everything we need for our assignment. God, over my Gen Z years, my 20-somethings and 30-somethings, I speak identity. Because Instagram got us thinking that we're not enough. Insta lies got us thinking that we got to be a boss by 22 and a millionaire by 24. The culture shuns people who work hard. Like you're not, you're less than a person because you got a nine to five. The devil is a liar. 
God, I'm doing what I got to do to feed myself and my family. But because I got a plan, I can take the money that I got on that nine to five and birth my vision, God. So I'm getting a plan this year. I speak by faith over my teens, identity and security. God, they got peer pressure, they got so much stuff online and in the room that's pushing them in directions they shouldn't be in. God, thoughts telling them that they're not good enough or maybe they should do this. God, I ask that you just give them a sense of strength that they don't have to vape and don't have to give themselves away. They don't have to be in wrong crowds. They're blessed just like they are. God, to my 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and everybody, God, I speak fresh wind. God, some of us have kind of fought so long we tired. And so it's hard to be creative when you're tired. It's hard to be excited about life when you're tired. So, God, I speak fresh wind, fresh oil, fresh anointing. God, I speak strength. God, we need you like never before. And somebody's struggling because they've been praying for a long time. They've been giving for a long time. And they're like, God, when is it going to be my season? <coughs> we claim it right now, God. We claim it right now, God. We claim it right now, God. Mm. I may not see it now, but I know it's on the way. I may not see it now, but I know it's on the way. I may not see it now, but I know it's on the way. It's on the way, it's on the way, it's on the way, it's on the way. So God, give us strength to be what you called us to be. It's in Jesus' name. Clap your hands right there. Yeah. yeah. Did you get anything out of that today? Come on, anything? All right, listen to me when I say this. Somebody say strong. I'm strong in my prayer life. Hear me when I say this. Here's what I do personally. I'm going to always tell you what I do, and if you want to do more than that, that's between you and God. You know, every day at 11.55, my alarm go off. Who phone go off at 11.55? Anybody? So do me a favor. Set your phone. Every day at 11.55, that's when I pray. I will literally be in a meeting talking. And my phone say, duh, duh, duh. Father God, in Jesus' name, thank you for what you did. And I just get right. I want to condition my life for prayer. You got me? Strong prayer life. I'm a giver. I'm a tither. Tithing is between you and God. I had somebody tell me yesterday, I had pastors, real soft band, I had pastors from across the country uh, in town all weekend kind of getting vision. And they said through our vision day, and the pastor at the end said, all right, I tried not to ask. He said, I've been in your church five times. How do you pay your bills and you don't raise, <laughs> raise offerings? I said, man, that's between you and God. I never wanted to be the type of pastor who stand here in his five offering periods. Y'all know what I'm talking about. It. And it's that building fund up there with the bubble and nothing changed. I'm not doing that. No, that's between you and God. I can tell you what works for me. I have a strong prayer life. When God blesses me, I honor God. That's how I do it, man. That's how I do it. A strong prayer life. I'm strong in my giving. Here it is. And I'm strong in my serving. We have so many things we're about to roll out this year, especially to all of my young men and my young women, my young professionals. But there's a generation that we can set up to be great. There's a generation that we can set up to be great mentoring programs. This summer we have a lot planned at Rock City with an intramural league with softball and base basketball and flag football on the fields. I want you to get comfortable and get used to giving something back to God as far as your gift and your talent. You know, I was telling some of my young entrepreneurs, I said, man, y'all got these businesses. When y'all going to do a summit at the church? They said, Pastor Mike, I'll do it. I'll show them how to set their business. I said, let's do it. I'm going to say this. How can I preach to you that favor is coming, but then don't provide you with conferences and seminars on how to fix your credit, how to get your EIN number? how to get your life insurance policies that accrue cash value, how to purchase properties, how to go to the land bank and get a property, then take out an equity line of credit and fix that property, flip that property and keep going. We finna get it. Arise. Am I preaching to anybody? We're about to be what God called us to be, and I'm excited about that. I love you so much. Do me a favor. You may not know Jesus. And I'm not going to call you out in front of everybody. But if you're in this room and you want to give your life to Christ, maybe you're in this room, you say, you know what? 
I need a fresh start. I just want to be what God called me to be. Right where you are, all you got to do is even under your breath, you can say, Lord, come into my heart. Make me over again. I confess with my mouth. I believe with my heart that you rose from the grave with all power in your hand. And right now, by faith, I am saved. It's that easy right there. Clap your hands. It's that easy. If you're watching online, you can text HOME to 28950. Now, let me say this to you. Here's where we fail sometimes in our walk with God. You just got saved, but now the question is, are you what? Strong. And when I get saved, he brings me out. If I want to be strong, I got to be discipled. That's why things like Devo Energy is important. We're going through the Word every day. I don't know about you, but my day don't feel right if I don't go through Devo Energy. I just turn it on and be ironing some days. I have to hear that Word in my heart. It's the equivalent of not putting your phone on the charger at night. At some point during the day, what's going to happen? Your phone going to die. So I'm telling you to plug in. Plug in and be what God called you to be. I love you. I believe what God has for you is about to be so strong this year. I pray that you have a blessed week. Can I pray us out of here? Is that okay? Again, our special guest, we love you guys so much. Thank God for y'all coming. Repeat out to me. Say, Lord, your will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll see y'all in the morning on Devo Energy. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. expectation. We knew God was going to do something special today. Uh, and in the room and at home, I know you can feel the power and the presence of yes, God. God. What a dynamic, powerful work. No shortcuts. No shortcuts. Because you know what? When I think about taking a shortcut, I got to remember, it's all mine. That's right. It's all mine yeah. as long as I stay committed and faithful to the process. I mean, there is such a sweet spirit in this place, James. I, I almost don't even want to go home. I just want <laughs> to sit here and bask in God's presence. But, you know, Pastor talked about this transfer, yeah. right? How Moses represented dead strategies. Yeah. And Joshua, you know, he represented new strategies, yes, right? Yes. New revelation. And so just excited about what God is doing in this new season, Ooh, how yes. he has called us to be that Joshua generation. And so th the bottom line is, look, if you've been waiting on anyone, yes. the truth is we're waiting on you. We're God waiting on is you. waiting on <laughs> you to get in position. And so maybe... You're at home, you're watching live right now, and yeah. you feel a tug at your heart. You've heard a knock at the door. The Bible says the day you hear my voice, harden oh, not your heart. Yes. Pastor went through the prayer of repentance, how it's so simple, yeah. right? So text that word home to 28950. A lot of times we overcomplicate this thing. Yes. But listen, God is waiting on you. We are waiting on you right here at Rock City. This is a part um, of the journey that you don't want to miss out on. And speaking of not missing out on, yeah. you also don't want to miss out on giving. On giving. Don't, don't miss out. Listen, you can't be God given. That's we, right. You know, Pastor Mike just talked about it, you know, between you and God, being faithful to what God has given you. I love the fact that God blessing us, blesses us first. Then yes. he just asks for us to give us back what belongs to him. So yeah. if you're giving, text I rock and the amount to 28950. That's I rock and the amount to 28950. You know what else we want to miss out on? Yep. Is this fast. Ooh, Make sure we stay fast. committed to the fast. I love how Pastor Mike said it. He said, listen, whatever you're giving up, whatever you're sacrificing, uh, just be committed to it. Yeah. You know, whatever it is, if it's a social fast, if it's a food fast, financial fast, whatever it is, be committed to it because we're believing God for so much this year. If it's going to be the strongest year of our life, we got to stay committed to the process. So text fast lane yes. to 28950. That's fast lane to 28950. Tomorrow morning, it's yes, Devo Energy, Energy. 721 a.m. Central Standard Time, uh, 721. We're going to be talking about the word that we were just blessed with, no, sh no shortcuts, all week long, Monday through Friday. So make sure you lock in with us. Uh, and also, we're going to talk a little bit about the fast, make sure we're all holding yep. one another accountable and being committed to it. Amen. Listen, I think there's nothing else to say, but we do want to once again celebrate our man of God. Y'all, yes. it has been a power-packed, spirit-filled weekend, weekend. weekend, and it really started early for him at the top of the week, yeah. and for him to hit this 
stage oh, this pulpit and pour it out. I mean, he left Twice it all today. out. Twice. Twice, right? <laughs> Look, at the first service, he ran to the front, ran back on the stage. Right. And so we truly thank God. So let's continue to lift up our we man of you, God, PNK. that God will cover him from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. Shout out to the first family. Yes. Listen, and for all of us here at Rock City, Rock Nation, worldwide, Everywhere. wherever you're watching, we love you. Stay tuned, stay committed, yes. stay locked in. I love it. The best is yet to come. We'll see you in the morning. Peace.